Hi right, everybody. Round seven of the top of Tata Steel Chess Tournament. This uh game is between Karyakin with the white pieces, Sergei Karyakin, and uh Levon Aronian with the black pieces. This game just concluded a while ago. So I'm gonna go through it briefly but hopefully informatively. This game disappointed me from Black's perspective, and I'll get into it, uh, get into the reasons why doing the analysis. I did not like how Aronian played. I remember a few years ago, man, this guy, they were talking about this guy being potential challenger to the world championship, and um, he's a great player. It seemed like he slipped off a little bit. I mean, he's still very strong, but um, it's just sad, you know, we're not speaking of, of Aronia in, in that context so much anymore. This here is just, to me, just a bad game <laughs> by Black. Especially with this opening. So E4, E5, Knight E3, Knight C6. Knight of Roy Lopez. But your Joko Piano. Um, what this does is avoid a lot of, you know, Berlin defense. And that's kind of uh, what has led to the... Um, Reemergence of this opening, so to speak, just avoiding those uh, Roy Lopez lines and uh, kind of playing similar to the Roy Lopez but avoiding the Berlin Wall. Bishop c5, there's tons of theory on this castle. And of course, uh, white can play c3, there's all types of things that can be played. Um, Evans Gambit with Bishop b, um, excuse me, b4. C3, D4, Castle there. There's a lot of opportunities here. D3 can be played. But um, nowadays in this uh, modern era, uh, what I find interesting is that even though these older openings are being resurrected, like the Joko Piano, is they're being brought back, but in, they're being played in a more positional way. Um, a long time ago, you would always see C3 in the Joko piano. C3, D4, uh, even Evans Gambit, Kasparov had resurrected that back in the 90s. You would always see these kind of games played in an aggressive style. Um, you know, your Max Lang variations and, and such. But now, it's like the opening is returned, but in like a slimmed down uh, way, so to speak. <clears throat> you don't see the um, you know it's a much of the aggressive nature the opening so castle knight f6 attacking the pawn right there d3 and one has to be careful because uh, these openings are interrelated the bishop's opening um, joker piano two knights game all the positions are very very similar and it's easy to transpose um into lines of the various openings so you do have to be careful somewhat and here I believe Aronian had made a mistake which I don't understand uh, why he would go for uh, into this position like willingly if it were if it weren't a mistake so after castles which is reasonable h3 he plays d5 here which is perfectly playable don't get me wrong but it's not the best it's not the best line for for black I mean um, the e point what happens is with this early break of d5 this e pawn uh, of black often falls under uh, pressure and scrutiny as you're gonna see in the game and this is why normally you will see moves like d6 played and played in this uh, the black side played in the slower fashion you play d6 I like to play h6 first, but you can play all these moves. Remember these three moves where the arrows are. a6, e6, d6. Um, the reason is, is because if you if you play d6 first, and again, it's playable, but if you play d6 first, you got to just keep an eye on, you know, these, these type of situations. You know, and that's not even a big deal. But I'm just saying, if you don't like, you know, those type of positions, getting your pawns doubled or dealing with the pin. So that's often why D6 
will sometimes uh, get left behind. But you can't play D6. A lot of GMs play D6. That, that pin is not a big deal. But if you like to avoid the pin, you could just play H6 first. Okay, and then play D6. Another way uh, it gets dealt with too is you see this move A6 gets played first. And then if and then uh, if Bishop G5, this Bishop will drop back to E7 without even... Uh, weakening the king side with h6 and then then d6 will come so there's different ways to deal with it so h3 and Aronian opts for d5 right away like I said it's playable but you know I think you give white more chances than it's necessary see now he's gonna work on this e pawn here knight takes d5 you see the pressure already. Bishop e6, and there's some tactical uh, ramifications. So this the pawn is not captured right away. So for instance, if knight takes e5, that would be a mistake there. Right? If the knight takes e5, rook takes e5, and then bishop takes. Um, F2 and now you should be able to see the position of the rook and you see what's going on so that would happen king takes and then the queen would come to F6 and then the rook would be gone so that's the tactical idea behind that so of course Aronia wants to <coughs> excuse me wants to take um, excuse me Karyakin wants to take this pawn but right now uh, he cannot uh, get it. We play c3 here. The bishop drops back. Because black always has to watch out for moves like b4, a6. And of course capturing the e-pawn. Because this is white's compensation for having this, this pawn which is a little bit weak. Is he? He puts a lot of pressure on this e pawn. So bishop b3 is played, and f6. <clears throat> All right. So now it looks like you know everything is good for um good for black. He's protected the um the, the f pawn. Problem is, is now he's weakened this diagonal, right? And white is yearning to play d4. Get the arrows out the way. Another thing notice too is after f6 was played, this bishop is now unprotected. And this allows tactics in the position. D4. See? The scrutiny of the e5 pawn that you know that it's under. It comes under a lot of pressure, and that's from black playing d5 just a little early. It's, again, it's playable, but it's it's one of those lines that, you know, why take that route? But maybe he felt he was prepared. Um, a different idea, instead of the D4 right, um, D4 right away by white, is C4. Okay, and again, it's playing against this uh, bishop right here. So let's say, for instance, knight there, C5. And you see, you're exploiting the, this diagonal being weakened by the move F6. You see, and black is in trouble already. So, for instance, he takes there, check, again, exploiting the diagonal, and then you just pick up the bishop. So, I hope you catch that idea there. So, C4, hitting the piece. And uh, it doesn't really matter where this knight goes. Like the you know the knight could go back there still still the same idea, and of course if he takes with the bishop then you just so I don't know what, if if Kariaki rejected that move I didn't see you know the interview or anything so I don't know if he rejected that move or he just didn't see it but that looks um that looks good to me. The only other alternative for black here is to play you know it's just sack the bishop and. You know, play a move like that and try to concentrate on this. 
course, white would just play d4, and then, you know, uh, black, black is in a whole lot of trouble. This is threatened. So, all these moves are kind of forced. And then white can just get his king back in the safety with g1 and just have a nice advantage. So, again, I'm not saying d5 in itself is bad, but it's just, um, it's a move that brings the black position under undue pressure. Here's another analogous line. And then we'll do it real quick. I don't want to take too long. Um, so, here's the bishop's opening. And I told you these openings are related. Two knights defense, joker piano, bishop's opening. Because the pieces wind up usually on the same squares. But if you know the systems real well, sometimes you can steer your opponent into inferior lines of, you know, the different systems. You know, with various move order tricks and such. You know, and that's for those heavily immersed in opening theory. But let's take the bishop's opening, for instance. So, e4, e5, bishop, c4, knight f6, right? That's one of the recommended, um, uh, you know, tries. d3. Right now, we know d4 can be played, you know, Eurosoft Gambit, but I'm not going to get into that. d3, and I'm going to show you an early example, an example of what I'm talking about, the early d5. Right? So, it's perfectly playable, right? Only the bishops here, right? You got queen and knight supporting the d5 advance. It's an advance you want to get in. Why not get it in, right? So, d5, e takes d5, knight takes d5. Now, watch the pressure that the e-pawn comes under. Knight f3, knight c6, castle, bishop c5, rook e1, right, and we have a similar idea, castle, knight c3, again, not being, not being thirsty and grabbing the, uh, the pawn right away. Although it's possible, but you do risk giving a uh, white some decent play, or black some play rather. But it already looks like uh, white can get away with grabbing a pawn. But this gives this gives a little bit of counterplay. So, for instance, um, I don't know, queen f3, knight f6. And these are just examples. G3. And white white is giving black some counterplay here. You know, the bishop's coming. And it's kind of reminiscent of like a martial attack here. You see, so got to be careful of taking that pawn too early. But here I actually think that white can take it. Um, so knight takes e5, for instance, right? And let's say if he... Yeah, it would tra it's, it kind of transposes into like a martial. Like if he plays knight takes e5, and when I say martial attack, I mean in a Roy Lopez. I mean, there's some similar ideas with this bishop coming here, queen coming here, etc. But I think that uh, white, black just doesn't have enough. <clears throat> but just going back to the illustration here, normally what's played anyway at that at that point after um, castle is knight c3 to avoid all all of the play there let's attack in this piece again knight takes takes and um white has a comfortable position here white is white is better because of this pressure on this pawn i mean if he goes back here G4 is playable. Queen E2, adding more pressure here. Rook B1, there's a couple of moves right here. Now back to the game. So the point I'm making is that although D5 is playable, the reputation is a little, you know, a little suspect. And like I said, I didn't like this weakening of the diagonal. 
So look what happens now. So D4, and I already gave you the recommendation that C4 might have been a little better. D4, Bishop F7, takes. And I don't even think Kariaka is making the best moves. But he goes into a, a, a simplified position. Bishop takes, takes. And look what black is stuck with. Black is stuck with the isolated pawn. However, in this position, due to Kariakin's inaccuracies, right? You're not playing C4 and just being um, way better. He gives black an isolated pawn, but however, there's a lot of play here for um, for uh, black. A lot of activity. Black is way ahead in development. And he has a lot of activity. And he should be able to um, use his open lines as a result of this uh, isolated pawn to his advantage. Let's see what happens. So, of course, I don't want to get into the isolated pawn too much. But the basic rundown is that black wants to, you know, the player that has the isolated pawn wants to stay active. Try to avoid trade of pieces. Try to control the lines on the sides of the isolated pawn in this case would be the f file and d file and um and if he had knights use these as outposts the squares but in this case he would have to use his rook or queen or something like that as uh for outpost and basically use the open lines and be active as possible to have proper compensation for that pawn plan for white is basically the opposite black wants to quench the activity when one of the ways is by trading pieces knowing that the closer he can get to a simplified end game that this pawn will become more and more of a liability so one of the things is that you want to control the square in front of the pawn to keep it from moving right you want to hinder and uh, blockade the uh, pass pawn and then eventually uh, while you're attacking the pawn the opponent will use defenders in order to uh, keep the pawn and then what you do is you switch the attack to the very defenders of the pawn trade them off and then eventually you win the pawn in theory of course you know the games have to be played so here black has definite compensation and i actually like black's position a little bit better but i still don't condone the opening with d5 because kariakin just didn't follow up correctly so bishop c6 is played, and to me, again, I I wouldn't want to get necessarily trade you know uh, trade my queens in that uh, situation. You can't do nothing about this bishop trade, you know, because what are you gonna do? Go you know to a5. However, I just said that you want to try to stay active as possible, and then he plays bishop c6. To me, that falls. This falls right into uh, Kariakin's hands. This is what he wants. Knight d2, right? So he's just catching up in development because Bishop c6 was like real passive. No, it wasn't active or anything, right? <clears throat> I mean, and right here, he doesn't trade here because it would just bring activate another piece, right? So he uses this, this, uh, I don't know, this loss of tempo, if you please, to activate another piece. So black is kind of breaking the rules with the isolated point, not active anything. So instead of me complaining, what should black have done? Black could have connected his rooks, right? Why not get the rooks into play? You know, what about a move like queen d6 or something? Yeah, he'll trade, but, you know, it is what it is. And then bring the rook over to the D file. You see, those are the general principles. I don't have all the answers, but those are the general principles. I know I want to be active, so I'm, I'm going to do stuff that gets my pieces going. I see the rook. I see the queen on D1. I would like to put a rook here in opposition to it. Right? I have a bishop here. You know? You know, it would be nice for me to have my queen here, right? Putting pressure here. Maybe move like C6. 
You see, you have to think like that when you have isolated pawns. You know, a good opening to learn to practice, you know, with isolated pawns is that uh, terrorist defense is black to the queen's gambit. Okay, so bishop e3, bishop c6 was played, knight d2, queen f6. So now you see Aronian finds, you know, a good quality continuation here, right? He's trying to be active. Rook wants to come here. Queen e2. But it's like that little loss of time allows Kariakin to get his pieces into the game. Remember, all of his pieces were on the back rank. And there it is, just as I said. Hope Kariakin sees that. <laughs> Plays f3. It's kind of a weakening move. And this is what you want. If you're if you're black, if you had the isolated pawn, you see while you're attacking, it's hard for uh, white to be able to concentrate on the isolated pawn. Rook a d8, and we see we see the tr uh, the contrast in ideas. White is trying to calm the position down. Black is trying to uh, rile the position up. So Kariak and trades. 94, there's the blockade, and you know I love uh, Nimzovich, I'm always talking about blockading, so there's the blockade, so this pawn is fixed, and now it's ready to be attacked, rook f4, and like I said, the one that has the isolate, isolated pawn wants to control the lines on the sides of of the isolated pawns. That's very important to control the files on the sides of the isolated pawns. Of course, he would like this square too, but you can't have everything. Rook AD1. Of course, he wants to trade off. Right? So you knowing, you knowing this, you wouldn't want to trade off as black. You want to try to find some kind of active move. Right? I mean, you, you hate to give up the file, but you definitely don't, don't really want to play this move unless you have... Some kind of concrete advantage that you can gain from doing that. So he plays rook df8. He avoids that. Now he puts more pressure here. And he's actually threatening to take. So if it was black small, he could take here. Rook takes f3. And this pawn can't take because of the pin. So he makes a threat. Another threat he could have made is just rook a8 threatening this pawn also. Right. Okay. This queen c4, and this is part of the reason why he might have not played rook a8. Because even if he took the pawn, this queen c4 check might have picked up the rook later. Okay, king h8. Okay, Kariakin gets out of that situation with the the rook takes f3. H6, we know what that's about, just making some room for the king. You don't want to get caught out there uh, moving, you know, the pieces off the back rank and then get made it. Rook D2. So now, um, Kariakin wants to use the open file, right? There's only one open file, he wants to use it. King H7. Queen to d3 king h8 now this just this is only can only be good for white because basically Aronian just wasted a tempo with this move and again with the isolated pawn and you know me preaching about being active you can't you can't have moves like that in a position he already played h6 and king h7 so now you can't just have a move like king h8. Rook d2. Getting ready. Right. Attack this pawn. Queen e6. Here. And looking at that pawn. b3 is an easy defense. Rook to f7, a rook 4, f7.
queen e3. Rook e7. Now, what's happening? This is black. Is if you noticed in the last few moves, black is becoming more passive. So it's basically run out of ideas, and now he's going into defense mode. And now the game is turning into white's favor. Because once black's initiative goes away, then he's just stuck with the pawn weakness, and it's all downhill from there. So contrast this position with um, a few moves ago when black was so aggressively placed. Look at, look at this position. Right? This is when black has chances right here. You know, I don't have to to draw any arrows. Fast forward. Now look at the position. Okay, queen f2. Queen to d5. Rook e3. Queen a5. Queen b2. Rook f e8. Again, this is all favorable for white. Black is, because black is now playing like a positional game, and, but he doesn't have a good position. Like his pawn structure is busted, so he's, he should be playing dynamically. But he's playing positionally with a bad position. C4. Bishop d7. And now, these ideas come into play. Thus, bishop c7, so that white can play, excuse me, black can play c6. There it is, knight c3, c6. He goes back. And this is, uh, would fall under the category of maneuvering in chess. So, because you might be like, man, he's just wasting time moving the knight back and forth. No, he's not. What he is, is just provoking uh, black to make additional weaknesses. So, first, you see the d5 square. Now, under any circumstances, black can't get that up, right? So, look what happens. So, it's not like he didn't see that he could just do that. He did it on purpose to force him to make that move c6. And now, look, now he has a square that he cannot defend. Which is d6. Now he hops right back in there. Now how do you defend that? Only way he can defend that is by putting a piece there. If he puts a piece there, the piece is passively placed. You see? Then you keep keep building the position like that. You see? Now the position now the piece is just you know, kinda doing like a defensive duty. So black is definitely in some trouble here. Simple attack, and you see the build up on this square. Bishop c8, and now the knight can hop in. Does b4 first, and basically he's just driving the pieces to more passive locations. So for now, the rook came to here, defensive posture, and now the queen is just being driven back. Now, we know the queen doesn't belong there. Again, remember what I told you before. Black wanted, want, should be active and um, aggressive with the isolated pawn, but now he's been reduced to passivity. And this position is terrible. Knight comes in. This is all real simple chess, too, and there's holes in the position. You see? Knight has places to go. And then, this move can be played, too, to, fort, to fortify the knight at uh on the d6 square and when the knight gets to d6 and um you know uh, and it, it can stay there with the support of a pawn you know has an outpost on d6 it's well known that that knight is uh sometimes worth even more than a rook right and many times the rook will sacrifice itself on uh, d6 for that knight because that knight is just too strong in that position Again, pat passivity. You know that move says, "Please don't hurt me." I'm sorry. Please don't hurt me. That's that's what that move says. Rook eight e seven says, "Please, you know, just let me let me go home." You know, I don't want any more. 
Rook E D three. This is educational. Notice how Kariakin put pressure on the uh isolated pawn, forcing black to defend, and then he switched the attack to the D six square to the bishop that was on D seven. And now he controls the D file. And now these rooks are misplaced defending this pawn that's not even being uh, attacked anymore except by the queen. However, notice that with all that maneuvering, the pawn on E5 still remains blockaded. Like he can't advance this thing. Only he can, but it have to be in a, uh, as a sacrifice. Rook D7. Queen C2. Rook E E7. Queen to F2. Queen B8. And Queen just takes the pawn. Queen takes B6. And there it is. He he exploits this pin right here. Of course, Kariak has seen it. But he sees that he's winning. F takes e4. Rook takes e4. So finally, right, he gets rid of his, his weakness, his isolated pawn. He liquidates it, but unfortunately, he's lost in the position. These pieces are basically imprisoned right now. Queen F2. Right, there's all kind of nasty stuff going on here. This move. And the sad part about it is it's hard, he can't really defend. I mean, if he goes back here, you have knight here, the double, you know, it's over. This rook will just be captured. So this is horrible. King G8 comes comes Queen G3 and now the knight is free to, free to move and black has to be careful because of uh, potential discovery attacks later on the queen that's not protected rook e e7 and there's the move I was telling you about the outpost this I mean this is just a great game played by Kariakin Inferior game played by um, Aronian, but Kariakin is just doing what he has to do. He's taking care, you know, taking advantage of the position. Queen c7. That's totally uh, defensive. Good move. This this forces liquidation of everything. This is all forced. And. This is just a um, good chess right here by uh, uh, Kariakin. Rook f7. Of course, if rook takes d1, then just simply knight takes um, e7, followed by the bishop getting kidnapped on c8. And then we can see that <clears throat> black is just lost there. So... This is why the rook on d1 was not captured. Instead, this rook was brought to here. And now you have simple moves like knight takes h6 check, forking the king and queen, which happens. King h7. Knight takes f7. Rook takes d1. And now we have this is a... Uh, it's a pretty simple position for um, White, who is up two pawns. Again, outpost is too strong. That piece, that piece on d6 is worth the rook. But of course, if he gives up the rook, he's lost anyway. So keep fighting on. Okay. Okay, now he finally grabs the pawn on b7. And 
there's no stopping uh, the A pawn. This B pawn, nobody cares about that B pawn. It's all about this A pawn. He takes, there's no stopping it. And he gets behind the pawn, as um, the old chess rules say. Rooks belong behind past pawns, and that's what he does. There's no way to stop it. Rook B2, so he figures he'll, get, you know, have a miracle happen somehow and um, get some kind of mate or perpetual going on, a whirlwind attack, whirlwind attack. So, how would you deal with this threat? Would you bring your rook here to G2? You could. That's kind of passive, isn't it? All right, think about it. If you want, you can just pause the video and try to work that out. Only thing about bringing the rook here is now he could put his rook here and capture this pawn. All right, and we don't want to do that. We want to keep. We want to push this pawn and queen. All right, so we just got to figure out a way we can do that. Okay, so check it out. That's it. Simple as that, because after rook takes, you know, the king just moves, and again, this position, it doesn't matter. White is up material, but again, it's all about this pawn here, so he could give up everything as long as he gets this queen. And there, Aronian resigned, because there's nothing, um, nothing happening. After rook takes g2, king h3, then what? No, that's a wrap after that. <clears throat> Maybe rook f2 to try to get back. But then a7, rook f8, and then that's all she wrote. <clears throat> so that's it uh, for that game. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe. And uh, leave your comments below. Again, remember, if you're playing um, Black Side of the Joko Piano, you can play d5, but... Is, uh, there's simpler ways to deal with this thing. Just play moves like h6, d6, and a6, you know, and just, uh, you know, play it, play it from there. So, anyway, I'll see you guys on the next video.